Hi everybody, welcome to the latest uh, Conversation Aviation podcast from EASA's Together for Safety. I'm John Franklin, Head of Safety Promotion here at EASA, and today we're going to talk about the topic of standard phraseology. Um, hopefully you saw the last podcast that we did with Paul Stevens from the Mayflower College talking about language proficiency in general, and now kind of this is a, a next natural follow-on today. Uh, I'm joined by uh, someone uh, I'm really excited finally to get to talk to in a podcast rather than we, we had particularly during COVID and uh, there was a group of us talking about safety management and how we can kind of improve just the way we communicate and promote safety in general and particularly safety management. So uh, it's great to have you join me, Stephen. So uh, maybe you could Thank introduce you. yourself to the audience and then you know just give us a little bit of background about yourself. I will do my best, of course. Uh, my name is Steven, uh, 41 years old, living in the Netherlands, uh, currently flying on a 737 and I did a lot of things in the past. I've been flight instructor uh, for a small uh, training company in the Netherlands, doing all various ratings uh, within that. I've uh, been compliance and safety manager for an ATO, uh, an AOC, a CAMO, an AMO and an FCD operator. Uh, next to that, I have my own consultancy company, working with EAS as well, of course. And uh, during COVID, uh, I was also um, senior inspector of airspace, uh, which worked for the other side as well. So really interesting. And now I'm back to flying again, luckily, and doing uh, consultancy work. Yeah, it's, uh, the thing I always found really interesting is your career's kind of done so many, taken so many twists and turns yeah. that yeah you you've kind of you've got experiences in so many different places and so many different things from you know big operators large aircraft you know you used to fly the 787 remember yeah. when we first met you know down to then working for small ATOs and and that kind of thing it's kind of yeah you know, you've got an interesting background yeah i never chose it but uh, somehow i ended up with doing various stuff and i always remained in aviation the first time i had to make a decision about that was when i had a stroke then basically my career stopped and then I thought, well, when, do I want to stay in aviation or I'm going to do something else, completely different? Because it's hard to see the aircraft flying and you're not, you can feel you can fly them, but medically you're not allowed. So yeah, that's, uh, but then I chose to stay in aviation and that's, that's been the career ever since. And I think it's important perhaps to mention to the audience, some some of you hopefully, well hopefully some people will remember when COVID first started and you know, the industry was going through all these, you know, the whole sudden upheaval and people were finding themselves to, to suddenly having to do new things is you wrote an article for us that we, you know, I know an awful lot of people read basically sharing your experience when you'd had yeah. your stroke and, you know, having to kind of go through what so many pilots were going through during COVID kind of some years before. And, and I think, you know, those experiences and, you know, the resilience that you've shown throughout your career, you know, you were also impacted by COVID and, you know, you had to kind of, you know, pivot go and you did some you work for the authority and i think that resilience that you know is it yeah. that's in your personal story i think it's a great message for everybody whatever you do yeah and it helps me as well that i like to remain a little kid like the little kid seeing aircraft flying like oh, i want to do that i still have this feeling every day like wow i want to fly the airplane and i'm flying the airplane wow i'm flying the airplane yes i, ca I can't believe i'm here yeah <laughs> Yeah, it's, oh, it's just so cool. And every time I'm enjoying the view. So, yeah, that's uh, I'm living my uh, dream, basically. And some more, and, actually. <laughs> and, and I guess that's the thing, isn't it? It's one of the challenges I think we have in aviation is we is remembering. I think so many of us, you know, I had a similar thing. I grew up at uh, my dad worked for a, a small airline at Norwich Airport in the east of the UK. And you know, I spent all my childhood watching like F-27s and uh, you know, Heralds and, and Shorts 330s and 360s fly around this regional airport looking at them going, oh my goodness. Yeah. I, in fact, I was on a, uh, a, there was a Facebook, a Facebook group on kind of flying in the 70s and 80s that uh, I'm a member of and people were talking about the smallest aircraft that did commercial passenger services mm -hmm. and I remember my first flight was from Norwich to Birmingham on a PA-31 Navajo Chieftain. I'm thinking, you know, I mean, that was just so exciting to, to kind of do that. And I think it's remembering really why we came into aviation is, is kind yeah. of one of the things and trying to trying to keep that enthusiasm going. It's not so easy sometimes. No, no, it isn't. No, no. 
What, keep, what keeps you? What keeps you excited then? Well, it's ever. There's never. There's the day is every every day is different, and you you never score one hundred percent. You always make mistakes. Like, like in radio telephony, standard phraseology. I still, after how many years in aviation now? That's uh, uh, twenty years almost. I still make mistakes, and uh, all colleagues point me out to the mistakes. Like, hey, you're saying that wrong. Oh, really? Never noticed that. Because it's a slang, it's it's getting into there. So, and it's I, I think that's such an important better. thing. Yeah, I, I think that that kind of culture of having that positive culture of learning, whatever mm. the topic, and you know, it's a kind of a good opportunity to kind of talk, get on to the main topic we were going to discuss today, <laughs> is radio telephony and and particularly yeah. standard phraseology. Is yeah. I think it's a classic thing where you can either kind of whether you're in the cop particularly two pilots sit next to each other in the cockpit you can either just kind of skip stuff and let it go or hopefully create that environment where you can go hey you know you can share that the, the yeah. mistakes you make with each other and and learn from that kind of thing yeah because it's the radio telephony it's just another language okay it's english but it's like i always say it's the shortened version of english to make it more effective because we don't have a lot have one have long conversations on the radio uh, because there's not a, not enough time for that. So uh, uh, if we look at it as another language, there will be slang and there will be changes into it. But the basic document, which every student is le learning, has not really changed that much since. Uh, and, and is it something when you were going through your training 20 or 20 years or so ago? Was it something there was a lot of focus on? And certainly, like you say, when, when you were in an ATO as well, is it something that kind of was just, yeah, there were lots of other things that were a much bigger focus or was it something that instructors would, would kind of keep on about? And well, all of, that of course, kind of the theoretical part in the classroom, there's, a re there's practice sessions, then yeah. there's a lot of focus, of course. And then, then you're really learning the basics. But already in the aircraft, the focus is on flight training, not really the talking. Yeah. And in the beginning, of course, you're not talking as a student because you need all your attention to flying the aircraft. And after a few lessons, then they start to introduce the radio telephony as well. So, hey, let's do the startup call, uh, etc. And then you start talking on the radio. The first time, really nervous, like, oh, somebody's listening to, everybody's listening to me, like this podcast. It's like, does it Does it feel kind of scary that first time? And I'm not yeah, a pilot. Yeah. I remember as an engineer kind of calling, as I'm, you know, moving aircraft around when I was originally an engineer, you know, moving yeah. an aircraft around, having to call air traffic was so scary. But as a pilot doing all the time, you know, when you first start, it must be quite daunting. Yeah, the first time you press that button, it's like click and then what do I need to say again? <laughs> and then you make mistakes and then you make a few mistakes. And after a couple of times, you're, like, you're chatting around on the radio. And everybody still makes mistakes, so yeah, that that's normal. You laugh about it, and then uh, you continue. And and do you find, you know, as you're flying around, do you find, and uh, you know, it, it, one of the things I was talking to Paul about particularly was was the challenge that sometimes as native English, well, as a native English speaker, native English speakers can be the worst almost because they they find it more natural to slip into slang and all of yeah. those kind of things. Do you kind of see that? kind of theory playing out on the radio when you're flying from one place to another or yes but the thing is uh, if you're a native speaker then you have a lot of more options to talk to to communicate what you want and if you're non-native and you only have learned certain phrases and you're getting in a non-standard situation then it's becoming a lot more difficult so the, there's both ways advantages and, and have you seen that, I guess, you know, particularly as a, as a non-native speaker, do you find, you know, particularly if there's a, a challenging situation, I guess uh, uh, the more you do it, the easier it gets. But, you know, trying yeah. to almost think it, potentially think in one language, deal with an emergency or a problem and communicate in, in, in English as a second language. You know, it's not as easy as I think as people might, you know, particularly native English speakers it comes easily but to a lot of people it is a challenge isn't it well you actually have to make a decision to talk english if you're non a non-native speaker so yeah uh, for example if you're with a group of persons and nine of them are dutch and one of them is english you have to make the decision the the the, the actual decision to speak english otherwise you'll just refer to dutch because yes. it's your native language it's easy to talk 
if I'm uh, discussing something with the ground in, uh, in Eindhoven in the Netherlands and I need to discuss something else, I'm tending towards Dutch, but I have to make the decision to talk English. Yeah, and I think that's, uh, I know it's a huge debating point. Yeah, uh, there are certain airports around Europe and, and the world where multi-languages are used quite regularly. Do you find that happening still in quite a lot of places? Does that create yeah. a challenge for you in terms yeah. of situational awareness? Well, uh, yeah, you mentioned the, the correct word. It's situational awareness. If somebody is talking another language, uh, uh, then I'm not understanding where he's going, what he's wanting. And I can imagine if it's a difficult thing or an emergency situation, then you're tending towards your native language. If that's possible, you'll try to do that. Uh, or you'll maybe choose to do that. And then, especially in those situations, if somebody is making an emergency descent or something, I want to know. But also in the normal cases, if I'm going into uh, Canary Islands and uh, there's an aircraft in front of me and I'm not, I'm not aware of his speed, for example, I'm flying too fast and I need to slow down again or maintain level and that's not making my descent very effective. But if I know he's in front of me, I can adjust my profile to that. So it's not, not only safety, but it's also comfort and uh, economy. Yeah, and I think that's such an important thing. I know there's lots of debate about the use of local languages and national languages. And in fact, uh, uh, we've, we've got a meeting later on today, particularly to talk about with our Sunny Swift uh, promotion stuff that we do for the general aviation community. Yeah. Is it's one thing in a commercial se se situation where there are lots of people from different parts of the world and for situational awareness purposes, it makes perfect sense and the ideal situation is that everybody uses English and standard phraseology so everybody has that situational awareness. But yeah. then when you're on a smaller air, you know, particularly a, an airport with no commercial traffic at all, and 99.9% .9 of the people that ever fly there you know, speak one language and it's not English, is you almost create a reverse situation. And it's, it's always difficult, you know, I guess, I know you, you fly from uh, Eindhoven quite a lot, and I guess yeah. when you're in a smaller airport uh, with less, you know, less continual commercial traffic, more of a mix of traffic, you know, sometimes I guess that's a bit of a difficult call, isn't it, sometimes? Yeah, I can fully understand because I'm flying, uh, I did flights from Hilversum, a small green uh, yeah. airfield in the Netherlands. There's a lot of Dutch talking. But the thing is, if we all try to uh, focus on speaking English, then we'll learn the language. Because if you're not doing it, like you say, you have to do it to learn it. And if everybody uh, uh, focuses on trying at least to learn uh, to speak English, and of course we'll make mistakes, but then we get a certain mindset in aviation that everybody's speaking English, and then you get uh, a common situational awareness. That's uh, a lot easier. And, and I think that's where particularly standard phraseology, a standard phraseology is so important, mm -hmm. and that you know if we take the basic premise that yes, everybody, we want everybody to speak English to maximize situational awareness, and yeah. then having kind of really focused on that is the, is, a using standard phraseology means people, particularly people learning other from you know, where, who don't have English as a native language, or people who aren't so confident in normal conversational English. At yeah. least they only have a stand, you know, they have a, a fixed number of things they have to learn, and it it's much more achievable, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And, and next to that, uh, for example, if I look at uh, the regulation uh, when I w wrote the, ar the article as well. Uh, yeah. I found out that pilots don't have to do refresher courses, for example. Controllers do, and they have the level 6 as well as us, but for us it's indefinite. But for radio air traffic controllers, it's a maximum 9 years valid. So there's a difference as well. So what I, what I would, uh, where there's a chance for operators and uh, flight schools and uh, local uh, aero clubs, is to incorporate a little bit more of RT's refresher training or uh, mm, yeah, checkings. That's really good too. Because there's, there's, no, there's no requirement, so why do we do it? Well, maybe it's checked during the simulator training or the LPC, OPC, but, but then the focus is more on the flying again, and not on, there's no focus on radio standard physiology. So there's, there's, yeah, I, think I think there's a chance for regulators and operators to uh, uh, 
some not put all the effort in but put a little bit more effort in to make yeah, it a little bit better yeah no, that's a really good point i think that's uh, yeah in the same way one of the challenges i know we have we have in general day-to-day -day speech i mean i have it now as a uh, as a father of teenage children you know language evolves mm -hmm. and the more you know if you're only checking i know like you say every nine years and it's valid for nine years language does evolve you know i look at my teenage well in fact now they're in their early 20s but particularly when they were teenagers you know seeing how their language evolved and language being used in general has evolved yeah. you know it's it, it's important to kind of keep this you know, have the standard phraseology almost like something to come back to and that kind of provides that grounding element and that yeah. you know potentially then also if the some of the standard phraseology needs needs to change you know is that we have a way of at least evolving if we need to yeah, it's inter interesting. A uh, nice example is copied. If I say every pilot listening, just remember the word how many times copied is used. Mm. Just, uh, the, for example, uh, in an easy clearance and then you say copied or the, the wind is uh, 360 uh, knots costing 26 copied or uh, there's traffic uh, on your left side copied. Copied is nowhere in the standard phraseology, but everybody's using it. And that's the example in my article as well, that my colleague pointed yeah. out. You say copied. We don't use that. Oh, really? Do I say that? And then you start noticing it. And, oh, yeah, really? And then you make a joke about it because it's, it's easy yeah. training then. And then you start correcting yourself. Yeah, and I think there's so many little bases. I know one of the other ones we talk about, you talked about in the article, is, is about... TCAS and the phrase here yeah, we yeah. see it on TCAS when yeah. again traffic in sight is the right way to say that and, yeah, and that's visual yeah, confirmation the, because we have it on TCAS doesn't mean ATC controllers are relieved from their duties as, as we have it on TCAS you're good for you but we need visual yeah. confirmation and maybe in the future the regulation changes of course and then TCAS is sufficient to say that the ATC controller can relieve himself uh, from that uh, separation uh, minima, but not yet, but yeah, we'll see. Yeah, and I think that's about one of the interesting things in a sense is to see how we cope with you know, more automation, more technology, even more technology in the cockpit. You know, yeah. what, are, what new things are we going to have to do, even just in terms of the way we communicate when we've got more and more uh, you know, these sort of air, air mobility air taxis flying around in their space and you know, more of these kinds of things could be an interesting one as well. And yeah, kind of how you fit all of those together and kind of manage it. And I, and I think particularly when, you know, as you said there about, you know, TCAS was one example and copied. And while that might seem quite natural, natural for many people is that similarly if you've got somebody who perhaps doesn't have perfect you know great english and, and only you know has their key phraseology words they use mm. limited to the standard phraseology as soon as anybody deviates you might as well say anything else if you know yeah. what i mean yeah, yeah, you might as well the, just say that's the beauty yeah. about aviation it's always changing it's always developing always trying to improve and yeah, like standard phraseology, you can always learn. You will always go back into slang and then go back to better again. So yeah, that's the, the, the beauty about aviation. I think there's always something to learn. And, and I think one of the key things, something also we touch on in the article is that it, it's one thing to talk about language itself, but it's actually you know, particularly important to be aware of those key moments in the flight where the risks of standard yeah well of, mm. where, where the risk of standard phraseology come but where communication problems can occur you know particularly you know taxiing around the ramp lining up on the runway you know making final approach those kinds of things is really focusing on you know is everybody particularly if visibility is bad for example is is mm -hmm. everybody's clear clear of the runway you know am i taxiing on the clear path have i gone the right way yeah. um i think that's a key i, I don't know have you ever so I, when I used to teach, teach human factors in, in, in the Air Force, we used to use, um, there was a, an incident many years ago at Providence, Rhode Island. I don't know if you've seen that with where basically a, uh, uh, an aircraft has landed and instead of taking one taxiway takes another one and ends up back on the active runway in really poor visibility. You know, and okay. that's everybody speaking English, but it's a classic yeah. example of, and there's a moment in, and we used to do it where, we just 
play the RT without give everybody an airfield map and yeah. little magnet tiles of which aircraft was which and keep mm. seeing if everybody figured out where they were and there's a moment in that where one aircraft thinks they're on a taxiway and they're on a runway and there's yeah. a moment then where the controller clears somebody for takeoff and it's only the captain of that aircraft saying i'm no, not comfortable not here yeah and i think it's it's finding those moments here what kind of key what are the key yeah. things that you know, that go through your yeah. mind are there what are the key moments in the flight where you're kind of double checking that kind of thing yeah for example if the runway is vacated or uh, the example you use uh, for, but otherwise if i'm on an approach and there's an aircraft in front of me and he's speaking in a different language that he's vacated the runway i don't know if he's vacated and of course uh 99 of the time you're visual with the runway so you can confirm yourself but yeah how about uh low visibility uh, operations when there's 200 meters or 500 meters visibility you don't see if he has vacated the runway so yeah the, uh on the ground so the, basically the closer the aircraft get the higher the risk and the less visibility because if you don't see anything uh it get, it's getting more difficult if we would switch off the camera now for the podcast and I'm going to start talking very fast. I would be less uh, be able to less understand, uh, or people would be uh, uh, not able to understand me, or less understand me. So yeah, that's the that's the problem. If visibility is gone, then there's one information uh, aspect uh, missing, and then you have to focus mm. on the other one. And if that's corrupt as well, uh, let's put it that, like that, it's getting a lot difficult, more difficult. And I think that's the most important kind of most important thing really is it's there's the messages around communication and using standard phraseology but it's you know ultimately oh. if you know where are the key moments where I, I, I like this phrase from Neil that we talk was part of the group is part of the group that we mm -hmm. talk we talk a lot about SMS one of the I remember one of the people uh, in New Zealand that he introduced me to uh, talks about the concept of what's the shit that might kill you at a really basic level yeah. and it's knowing that you know what is where are the moments and how can I just double check and make sure that yeah. the most important things are covered all of the time yeah, yeah of course the takeoff cool. and, well, and then uh, the closer the aircraft get but yeah, that, that you, that's funny about aviation, you always have to pay attention, or you always have to be on top of your game. Because shit can be around the corner. And I think that's the other thing as well, it. is, I, I guess particularly the moment, the moment also when you've relaxed and you think the risk moment has passed, is potentially the moment of greater risk even. Yeah. Particularly one of taxiing, the you know, is, I've seen a few weeks. One of the threats is complacency. That's something I always put in my briefing if I'm landing for the 100th time at Eindhoven Airport. Okay, one of the threats is complacency because we think we know everything, but then shit mm. hits around the corner. Like, oh, shit, we did not think about that. So, briefing. Yeah, it again. might be your 100th time, but it might be somebody else's first time and they have no idea yeah. what's happening, where they're going. Yeah, all of that yeah. kind of stuff. And yeah, yeah, it all gets really complicated. Cool. Well, we said we try and. You know, hit 20 minutes and we blinked and that's 23 minutes so yeah, yeah it was a great hope great little discussion thanks for joining us and uh, great to to finally get chance to talk to you in a podcast and for sure we'll you know we'll talk again soon and find another topic to cover and yeah sure come back and thank you for having me next time. awesome thanks very much take care catch you later take care. Bye. Have a good one thanks everybody